He is God. And he is all powerful. He is all knowing. And you know what? He's fighting for you. Amen. God bless you. Great to have you here this morning. Thank you for the wonderful worship with the worship team. Thank you so much for that. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> I was built with a built-in microphone. But I'm Pentecostal. And, you know, we have a, a, a theme as Pentecostal said, God may not answer my prayer, but he's sure going to hear it. So I got my loud voice from my dad, who my father, he had a very booming voice. And so this was a gift that I inherited from him. <laughs> Lord bless you. Well, sadly, Patty and I are winding down. We have two more Sundays here before we uh, return back to our home in the, in the United States. We, had, we spent one month in Germany at a church helping uh, with them, their church in Germany. And then we came here and we'll be here for two months. And so at the end of August, our, our visa is expiring. So we have to leave before they kick us out. And so uh, we, we don't want to be make the headlines that this Pentecostal pastor's in jail for violating whatever. So we need to leave, but we love being with you. You all have blessed us so much. This is like home for us. We just love worshiping with you and getting to know you. And thank you for all the little gifts that you've given to us along the way. And I have put them all into the ministry. Bread and jelly and chocolate. They've all gone into the ministry right here. <laughs> so thank you for your kindness. We appreciate it. We love you. Thank you, Pastor Kirk and Pastor Larry, for the invitation to come and be with you during this time. It has just been a tremendous honor and blessing for us, and we'll be here for a couple more Sundays. And so we hope to see you all those Sundays as well. I want to share this morning a message, but before I do, I'd like to just pray together. Can we do that one more time? Father, we just love you. You're so faithful. Your goodness is new every morning. And Lord, it even runs after us to bless us. God, there's no words to express how we feel. You're everything to us, Lord. And today, thank you for the opportunity to share with brothers and sisters of the precious like faith today, that we might exalt your name and worship you. Thank you for each one of them, Lord, for where they've come from and what they're, they're doing, Lord, for all the goodness that you've given to them. And Lord, today we pray for Israel, that you would be with that nation. We know, Lord, that it's yours. We know that it's a special place. And Lord, we ask one more time, that you would just keep your hand upon it. You would protect them. Lord, we pray for the peace of Israel to be made manifest. Help us, Lord, to always keep it before you as we exalt your name and that your name would be exalted throughout this world. And we thank you for touching their lives. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. God is so faithful. You know, when Patty and I first went to Venezuela 
and we had to speak Spanish. My Spanish was terrible. I didn't know hardly any Spanish. I was trying to put it together. We were, were not young people when we got to Venezuela. And so I was, was trying to learn the language. And pastors, when we would go visit their church, they would invite us to come up to the front and greet the people. And so I'm like, Lord, what can I say in Spanish that they'll understand me? And so I, I come up with this phrase, and I said, Dios is fiel. And that means God is faithful. Amen. And you know what? That became more than just a slogan or just a phrase. That became a testimony to my life. God is faithful. He's been faithful to me, and he's faithful to you. We sing about today that God can never fail. He won't. Because he's faithful. He's with us. He loves us. The word says he's before us and behind us. He's to each side of us. His goodness is so great, we can't declare it. Hallelujah. So that's what I want to share with you today. And I title this, Delay is Not Denial. Somebody has once said that God will always answer in one of three ways. Yes, no, or wait <laughs> later. <laughs> and so when we don't get the answer that we want, maybe he's saying, wait. And it's during those waiting moments in our life when we wait upon him that God begins to do a work in us. And that's what was happening with David when David was anointed king. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, starting with verse 10, so Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Are, there, are these all the boys? And Jesse said, the youngest is still left. But behold, he's out tending the sheep. So Samuel said to Jesse, send word and bring him, for we will not take our places at the table until he comes. So he sent word and brought him in. And now he was reddish with beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him. For this is he. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel set out and went to Ramah. What a beautiful story. Bible scholars tell us that David was between. 14 and 15 years old when this took place. When he was anointed king, he was around 14 or 15 years of age. But he did not become king until he was 30 years old. So for 15 years, there was a time of waiting and the word says that after David was anointed king, he went back to Ramah to tend the sheep. He went back to work. Delay is not denial. God anointed David as king, but it took 15 years to put it in place. There's a valuable lesson in that for us, that God will speak to us, that God will show us his will, but he knows the time frame. But during that moment, it was in the desert times when many people through the Bible began to find out who they were in God. And who God was. 
And so David was anointed king, and he went back for 15 years. Delay is not denial. Waiting for the promise does not mean God saying no. It just means we trust him. We trust him. He knows what he's doing, and we place our trust in him. You know, delay, when we're in that time of waiting, that is a time that builds our character. It molds us. He's rubbing the rough edges off. He's polishing us up so we can shine like a diamond. He is doing the work. He is not forsaken. He's not forgotten. He's not gotten mad at us. It's not like, oh, you blew it. No, the promise is over. I'm not going to promise you. But what he said, he will do. Delay is not denial, but delay brings a time to build our character where we grow closer to him. Some of you may have received a prophetic word at one time and it's not come to pass yet. A lot of times when we receive a prophetic word, we just assume that it's going to happen tomorrow. But really what it is, is just a confirmation of what God is showing us that's going to happen in our life in the future, down the road. To let us know we're still on track, that God is going to do it. Some of you may have received a promise from the Lord in your time of prayer. And it's not come to pass yet. And the enemy will come to you and say, see, I told you it wasn't going to happen. Why do you even trust the Lord? Unfortunately, sometimes the enemy even uses friends and family to come to us. Do so you still believe that? Are you still holding on to that promise? That's not going to happen. Just forget it. But deep inside, in your spirit, you know God spoke to you. It's building your character. God is building us. It's in those times in the desert when we learn to trust God. Trust God. You know, after David was anointed king, he went back to the, the field, tending sheep, just like, okay, that's over. Now, if that would have been me, I would have responded a different way because I'm not as spiritual as David. I would get my friends. I would say, Rodrigo, come on, let's, let's talk. Christine, come on, let's, let's, let's plan. Let's get a strategy for when, when I become king, we're going to do this. Gerard, come on, we're going to plan this out. We're going to have a strategy and a plan that when I get that crown, this is what we're going to do. Let's have a party. Let's celebrate. David didn't do that. He went back to work. Tending sheep. But it was during those times tending sheep that God was preparing him. You may not understand at the moment why you are in the season that you're in, but be assured God is working on your behalf. It is not in vain. And sadly, Many Christians, when they walk through a, a desert time in their life, they give up and say, well, God, God didn't do what he said he'd do. Instead of coming closer to God, that's what he wants. 
He wants to build us. He wants to make us stronger in the Lord. He wants us to trust him. And so we, we depend upon him. David went back to tend sheep, and that was his university. That was his school of ministry. That was where God was preparing him. And one day while he was out in the fields, his dad came to him with a lunchbox and said, David, here's some sandwiches, here's some food. Your brothers are out fighting Goliath and the Philistines. I need you to take this food to them, to give them some food to eat. And so David, he took the food and he went to where the battle was supposed to be. And he went and, and he looked and he saw both sides just waiting. And David said, what's going on? And they said to David, oh, it's bad. It's bad. See that giant over there? He's mean. He's threatened to kill us, to cut off our heads, to make us their slaves. And David said, well, what's the problem? What's the problem? Look at him. He's a giant. You know what David said? His response was in 1 Samuel chapter 17, 34 through 37. But David said to Saul, your servant was tending his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and took a sheep from the flock, I went out after it and attacked it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. And when it rose up against me, I grabbed it by its mane, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Since he has defiled the armies of the Lord. And David said, the Lord who saved me from the paws of the lion and the paws of the bear. He will save me from the hand of the Philistine. So David, so Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. The reason they hadn't been in battle was because all of the army of Israel was afraid of Goliath and the Philistines. And here comes this teenage boy. He said, who's that? Oh, he's the giant. You know, there's giants in your life that the enemy said, oh, you'll never overcome them. Oh, they're too big. Look at them. But it's in the times, it's in the times of waiting that we learn to trust God, that God's building our character when we understand who God is and the God that we serve is greater than any giant in our life. And so David went, and we know the story. He fought Goliath, and he won the battle. He didn't learn that in a Bible school. He didn't learn that in a class. He didn't learn that just by, by observing how the, the Israelites fought a battle. You know where he learned that? While he was out tending sheep, while he was waiting to become king. Your waiting time is not a waste. It's not in vain. God is preparing you to win the battle. And secondly, delay builds dependency upon God. In the time of waiting, in the time of our desert season, we learn to depend.
depend upon God. We understand it is not our intellect. It is not our gifts and our talents. It is not what we can do, but rather than the God we serve. Hallelujah. We depend upon him because he is high and lifted up. It builds dependency upon him. We learn to depend upon him. I love the story. In John chapter 2, or excuse me, John 21, the disciples said, we're going to go fishing. And so the verse says that they went and they fished all night and caught nothing. And they saw this man, Jesus, and he said, Hey, why don't you cast your nets on the other side of the boat? Do you know what an insult that is to them? Or it could be? Now here's Simon, or Andrew, James, and John. They were all sons of fishermen, and they were fishermen by trade. They knew how to fish. Jesus was the son of a carpenter. How many times do we say, but Jesus, you don't understand. You don't know. Just let me do it. I've been trained. I know what to do. And Jesus is just saying there, just put it on the other side. And we know the story. When they put their net on the other side of the boat, it was full. In our times of waiting, we learn dependency upon God. We learn to trust him, that God will be faithful, that God will be with us. He will help us. We were trying to buy a, a piece of property in, in Caracas, in Venezuela, for our church. And so we signed a contract and we started raising money. And about a month away from the, the date of, of, the, of signing the papers, we still lack $100,000. And I pray, God, do a miracle. And I prayed every morning, I prayed, God, to do a miracle. And one day I remember praying, Lord, I've done all that I can possibly do. I, I don't know what else to do. And so I just put it in your hands. I trust you. It was about two days later, another missionary in, in Caracas called me. And he said, Gary, there's a businessman here from California that came to Caracas for a business meeting. But today the business meeting was canceled. And so he wants to go around and, and just, just uh, know Caracas. He wants to explore and see all the sites. And I'm really busy. And so could you take him? And I had the phone in my hand and I'm thinking, well, you know, I'm kind of busy too. <laughs> But because I'm such a nice guy, I said to him, sure, I'll be glad to do that. So I met the man, never had met him before in my life. I met him and I took him around and showed him all the beautiful sights of Caracas. And I took him by the property, uh, the building that we were wanting to buy for our church. I explained the story. And he said, how much do, how much do you need? And I said, $100,000. And he said, okay, well, I'll be praying with you about that. And I'm like, yeah, okay, thanks. I've heard that before. <laughs> That's like the checks in the mail. <laughs> I said, okay, thank you. And we went on, 
in the afternoon, we were sitting at a little um, outdoor coffee shop, drinking a cup of coffee, and this man says to me, you know I want to help you with your project. And I said, okay, well, that'd be great. I had no idea what, what, he, what he could do. And so I said to him, what, what are you thinking? What do you want to do? And he looked at me with this strange look on his face. And he said, well, $100,000, that's what you need, isn't it? And I had a cup of coffee in my hand, and it began to shake, and so I had to grab it and set it down. I've never seen $100,000 in my life. And this is what he said to me. I, I said to him, you want to give $100,000? And this is what he said. God told me to do it. He sent the check. We made the payment. We signed the paperwork. And God did a miracle. In our time of delay, he is building our dependency upon him. Only trust him. Only trust him. He is faithful. He will do what he says. And then lastly, delay builds our faith. In times of waiting, our faith is increased. Because we know who God is and what God has done. David went and fought Goliath in faith, because he had already seen what God did with the lion and what God did with the bear. And, God, and David said, who's, who's this Philistine compared to them? He's nothing. I can fight him. In the desert times, in our times of waiting, God is building our faith to trust him and believe him and know that he is working on our behalf. In a, in a congregation of this size, there are people that are going through battles and situations and difficulties that maybe nobody else knows about. But God has not abandoned you. God has not forsaken you. God knows who you are and where you are and what you need. Trust him. Trust him. Delay brings faith in the Lord. I have heard wonderful testimonies from some of you in the church here of how God has intervened in your life, how God has done miracles in your life because you learn to trust God. Delay is not denial. God is working on your behalf. It builds each one of us. And God will complete his promises. His promises. Don't abort. Don't give up on what God has called you to do, what God has told you that he will do. He is faithful. in your personal lives, in your families. But even as a church, the International Fellowship, you've been in a season of waiting. And sometimes we, we want to cry out, God, what's happening? I want to see your notes. Tell me, what's going on? <laughs> but sometimes we just have to say, God, I don't understand, but I trust you. I trust you. You know why? Because we've already fought a lion and we've already fought a bear. And now when, when God uh, allows a Goliath to come into our life, we just say, God, I trust you, whatever. When we're in the waiting period, we know we have confidence that God will see us through. 
There's seasons in our lives. We sing about it this morning. There's seasons in our lives. And when we go through one season, it's because God is preparing us for the next season that he's going to take us into. So we cannot waste the season that we're in. We have to take advantage of where we are, what God's doing in our lives now, because he's preparing us for the next season he's going to lead us into. I grew up in an area in, in the United States that was agriculture. It was, it was a huge agricultural, and it's known for the wheat, all of the wheat fields. And as teenage boys, when we became 14 and 15 years of age, we would go and we would work for the farmers driving tractors. And we would be out in the fields and we would plow the fields and we would plant corn and we would plant the wheat and we would, would do the work that needs to be done. And along about October, it came time. They called it drilling the wheat. There was a time that we would go and we would plant the wheat into the ground. October. November came, nothing. December came, nothing. No signs of life. January, February, the ground was covered with snow. You could not see anything but white snow everywhere. March, the snow began to melt. April, spring came. And when you look out on the fields now, the snow is gone. And you know what you see? Little green plants poking up through the ground. Those kernels of wheat had gone through a season of germination. You couldn't see it. You didn't know what was happening. You just trusted the process that God's nature was a work. And it began to grow and would turn a beautiful golden brown. And long about June, the combines would come in and they would, they would do the great harvest of all the wheat. And when the harvest was taking place, nobody thought about in October when we drilled the seed or in January when the snow was on the ground. We just assumed, we just knew that God was doing the work. And there's seasons in your life when you have planted the seed, when you have prayed, when you as a church have done the work, you've done all that you can do, and now it's just a time of waiting. But don't be mistaken. In the time of waiting, God is at work. God's nature is taking place. And by God's nature, he moves in the supernatural. Woo. He is organizing, orchestrating, preparing, putting everything into place. So when the right time comes, we're ready for harvest. We may not understand everything. We may never understand everything till we get to heaven. But you know what? We learn to trust him. I believe in divine healing. God has healed me a number of times. I've seen Many people healed as we prayed for them. But there was a, a young man in our church at Caracas who was just a, God's gift to me. Every Sunday morning, early, I would be in my office in the church getting things ready for that day. And Gabriel would come and he would open my, my office door and he had a smile from ear to ear. And he would say, good morning, pastor. How are you? And this man knew my heart. He was a blessing that God put in my life. And he began to get sick. 
and get sicker. And we didn't understand. And he would never tell us. And we would say, maybe you need to go to a doctor. Maybe you need medicine. He said, no, no, pastor, I'm just trusting the Lord. Later we found out before he had gotten saved, he had been involved in, in a, a very promiscuous life, lifestyle, and he had contracted AIDS. And he was dying. And we were at the hospital one day when Gabriel took his last breath. And I went home and I sat down in my chair and I just started crying like a baby. Oh, God, I don't understand. You know what a blessing he was in my life. I know that you sent him to bless me and to help me. He knew my heart. He knew my vision. He knew where we were going as a church. I don't understand. There are things in your life that you may never understand why. But we still choose to trust him. We trust him. Stand with me this morning. Matthew 7, 11 says, so if you, despite being evil, knows how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? God is not going to give you something that will harm you or hurt you. He is fighting on your behalf. Every good and perfect gift comes from him. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I will trust him. There was a man that passed away just a few years ago. His name is Ira Stanfill. And this man wrote many of the, the hymns that we sing in our churches. When Ira was a young man, he married his wife and they became pastors. They were young. They were starting their life out together and their ministry together. And a few years went by and one day his wife just disappeared. Never told him she was leaving. Never said why. Never, she just disappeared. And for years he, he prayed, God, bring my wife home. God, do the work. One day he got a, a call from a friend. And the friend said, Ira, we found your wife. She's in New York City. And Ira got on a plane and went to New York City and started walking the streets until he found her. And his wife now was a drug addict. She was living on the street. She was homeless. Her body was just decayed. And when Ira saw her, he put his arms around her and said, let's go home, honey. Let me take you home. And she bowed her head and couldn't look at him and said, no, I don't deserve that. And she turned around and he never saw her again. And he went home and sat down as a young man with his life in front of him, hurting. And he sat down at the piano and began to write these words. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds the future. And I know who holds my hand. Church, I want you to know today that God has your hand. He has never let go. We are on a firm foundation and God will be with you because God is for you. Delay is not denial. 
It's time for us to grow closer to God because he's working all things to our good because we love him. Father, today we thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness. Lord, we don't deserve it. There's nothing we can do to ever earn your love. But Lord, it's by your grace that you love us in spite of ourselves. Oh, God, thank you, thank you that you love us. Even when we walk through times of waiting on you, we know that you're a loving Father who will not abandon us, but is preparing us for the next season. And today, Lord, I pray for those that may be struggling in a way that no one else knows about. Maybe it's financially, maybe it's in a physical need in their body. Maybe it's through family relationships. Lord, Maybe it's just a lack of self-worth that they don't, they don't even trust themselves. But today, Lord, I pray that you would come down in such a mighty, powerful, and beautiful way to confirm your love for us. And today, we choose to love you and trust you we trust you for this season that we're in. And we trust you for the season that you're preparing us for. Because you'll be the same God then that you are now. And so now, Lord, we commit it to you. We will leave this place today with our hope anchored in you because you are our, our hope of glory we thank you Jesus for what you're going to do in our lives we just commit